Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Asai Calderon Muñiz. All right. Welcome, guys. Today, we're going to be talking about norms and conditioning, like not specifically like, you know, operant classical conditioning. We will be talking about that soon. But basically, the way that we are trained to be the way that we are by society, these like societal pressures. Um, yeah, that's right. Basically, we're going to do like your seventh grade lecture on peer pressures is what this is going <laughs> to amount to be. OK, it's actually going to be a little bit more interesting than this and a little bit deeper, hopefully. Um, and if my experience with peer pressure lectures is any is any um, indication, um, but I'm pretty excited about this. I don't know, uh, like as I, if, if this is a, a topic that you think about much, but like, I feel like I think about this way more than I, sh- like, I don't, I want to say should, but like way more than <laughs> I would have expected. You know, maybe not as much as you do. Um, but it is a topic that I'm really interested in. I think that it's, we're going to have a really fun conversation today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to talk about, or not curious. I'm really excited to talk about how we behave in society as members of society. Yeah. So first off, you know, kind of like big picture is the term socialization, which I feel like everyone thinks they know what it means. And I have so many MCAT students that get tripped up on on an exam because they read the word socialization and they read that as socializing, which makes sense, right? Like going to a party, that's socialization. But that's not what socialization means within the context of like heavy psychology. Socialization is... Well, if you are socialized, that means you have been taught how to act by society. There's these like, you know, different ways that they can kind of like push you to act in one way or another, you know, like somebody like frowning at you or laws or just different ways that, you know, society as a whole, I, I want to say controls the way people act. And like, that sounds very negative, but like some of the controls are more positive, like, you know, like if if you litter, like there's laws against that. And so this is a way to stop people from littering, which I think most of us would agree is a positive thing, but that is still a form of control from society kind of like putting pressures on us. Yeah. In a way, right. It helps us strike a balance um, without any sort of control um, or any sort of norms. <laughs> we'll mm-hmm. talk about that in a bit. Um, you know, there's there's a possibility of this chaos, right? And just completely uh, losing our ability to interact with one another. But then on the flip side of that, too much, right, is also problematic. And so trying to strike this balance as a society of what we say is, not say as in like literally say, but sometimes just in our actions, say is okay and not okay. And so, you know, that socialization, like you said, when I was first studying for the MCAT, I also thought it was just, oh, you know, you're out with your friends or whatever. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's socialization, but it's really not right. It's this process of learning to be who you will be in society as, as a functioning member of society. Um, And so, when when society is kind of um, forming and, and figuring out what it will and won't allow, enter these these idea this idea of sanctions, right? So how are we actually going to execute that um, that limitation of what we do and don't allow? And so with sanctions, there are a couple of things to think about, right? There's a um, a formal sanction and an informal sanction. So formal being this is, you know, a law, like there will be concrete action that occurs as a result of someone's behavior. Whereas an informal sanction, this is something that might happen, you know, between us, for example, right? Like if, or between like, you know, two people on the street without getting law enforcement involved. Um, There's also the possibility of a positive and a negative sanction. Positive being, I reward you for this behavior, right? Negative being, this is a punishment for your behavior. And so that's something that I think sanctions has this very negative connotation. Like you did something wrong, Mm -hmm. you know, we are going to um, like, we're going to do something about it, but it can also be positive. We just tend to think about it in negative. And that's the context in which we, we normally talk about it, but (laughs) Go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah. I feel like the like sanctions when most people think about sanctions, or at least me, I, I normally think of like big picture, like global economic stuff with like, you know, North Korea is developing, you know, uh, nuclear weapons. And so we're going to impose sanctions on them. We're going to basically raise the cost of all of these things, you know, that normally our company or our country sells. To, to North Korea. And so like, it's a way to kind of punish them and get them to stop doing what they're doing. That whole negative positive thing is, I feel like 
pretty much just operant conditioning. Like, um, but like, there's absolutely some, some kind of like reinforcements there who reinforcements. Oh, that's, that's also <laughs> operant conditioning. Hard. Yeah. Um, but there's also some relationships there, but I, I really like the, just kind of understanding the formal versus informal. Cause I think a lot of stuff that people think, uh, like when they, th- when they think of sanctions, most people just think the formal sanctions, right? Like there's a law against this, there's a fine, there's something like that. Um, what I'm particularly interested in whenever I'm like thinking about this kind of on my, on my own is the informal sanctions. Um, do you have any good examples of informal sanctions as I? Trying not to think too much about peer pressure because now you put that in my head, um, but just kind of like excluding somebody, right? Um, so it's it's not an official uh, sanction, right? It's not something that is um, like, we're not saying you are never allowed to be with us again, but just kind of starting to slowly exclude somebody from, from a friend group and just maybe not, not telling them where you're going, but not officially banning them. Right. Um, that's kind of the example that comes to my head. Just you, you toss that yeah. idea of peer pressure in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like it can be some very minor things, like someone just frowning at you. Like you Mm -hmm. get in an elevator, you do something like you like burp really loud and like other people look at you and frown at you. And that is a sanction. You are being punished in a way for this action, which society deems is not appropriate. And that punishment in this case, I mean, it's just somebody frowning. So it's not like a formal sanction because it's not like somebody like wrote you a letter and like, oh, you have to go to court in two days from now because of whatever. But it's there's still this this kind of like negative pressure kind of coming in saying like, oh, we didn't like that. Um, And so it's like really interesting because this also depends on kind of like where you're at and like what the cultures are and that sort of thing, because something that might be punished in one area might not be punished in another. Um, Like, for example, like two, like uh, two people of the same gender walking down the street, holding hands, like you're going to get a whole lot of informal sanctions in some regions of the world and some regions of the country versus, you know, if you're doing that in the, like, why is you're walking down the street in San Francisco, like nobody's going to care. Um, and so these ideas that these things can change based on the society and the culture that you're in um, and just kind of paying attention to these things. I, I tend to be someone who wants to like buck trends and like do the opposite of what I've been told to do. And so I think maybe that's why I think about sanctions a lot and like the informal ones, particularly because I think there are times when society says like, Hey, you should do this thing. But in my mind, I'm like, that's actually not the right thing that people should be doing. And so I'm going to do the opposite of that. And then like, there's like punishments and things like that. Um, I think about, you know, during COVID and wearing masks, there's a lot of people that have very strong feelings one way or the other, and they're trying to push you to do something. I think I just hit my mic. Um, they're trying to push you to do something and, or like, you know, these, there's kind of like two different big camps there of like, you know, wearing masks and not wearing masks. And each side is trying to put pressure on the other, trying to get them to like the other side to behave the way that, you know, their side wants to behave. And that's like kind of an interesting thing. And even within that, it's so complex because like you mentioned, different parts of like the country and different places, different establishments might officially prohibit you, right, from entering their establishment if you're not wearing a mask. Different cities within the same states have fluctuated between um, requiring like having a mask mandate and then having masks recommended, right, that informal sanction of people just kind of giving you a side eye or staying very far away from you if you're not wearing a mask versus um, like it's constantly in flux. And so it's it's this, it's it's just this really interesting example, and I'm really glad you you brought it up. The other example I was thinking in my head is a, a little sillier, and it has to do with like singing um, and mm-hmm. like music and whatnot. So if you're in your home, right, or if you're with friends, it's not a big deal. If you're down the street, you know, you're walking down the street, and some friends and I have done this, we'll like play a song, and we're just like singing as we go down the street. Um, and sometimes we get a little side eye, not not usually though. And then if I were to do that, right, so. For those of you who don't know, um, if you're in an OR, a lot of surgeons will play music while they're operating. Um, And so there was this surgeon who uh, was 
two, three weeks, a couple of weeks ago, um, was playing this like pop music. And I felt the urge to start singing because <laughs> it was really like, it's just music that's really popular and just very um, singable. And I was like, nope, you cannot sing in this person's operating room. That is not okay. Right. I don't think that he, the, the surgeon would have kicked me out for singing, but there yeah. definitely would have been some informal sanctions for singing in the operating room. <laughs> yeah. That if, if they had written you up on that, I'd, I'd love to see that letter of just like so-and-so started singing um, like and punishing that. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I've, so there's a lot more of this kind of going on than I think people realize these like sanctions. They don't have to be the big formal sanctions. There's also the informal sanctions, which I think are kind of kind of important kind of overall generally. But, you know, I, you know, talking about the ways that we're pushed to do something is like we need some vocab for that. And that's like the socialization and the sanctions and that sort of that side of things. But we also need ways to talk about like what it is that society is wanting us to do. And there's different types and different ways to categorize this. And so what we call these overall is norms. So norms are things that are normal. Like what society has deemed, like this is the normal thing. This is what you should be doing. It's really easy to to, to remember what that means because norm is just what, what's normal in the society. And so this can be broken down into some subsets. There's things that are folkways, and then there's things that are mores. And the mores is M-O-R-E-S. Um, I, I always call it like mores and then mores. I know mores is like the correct term, but if you see it written, it looks like mores, like M-O-R-E-S. Um, but these are kind of interesting because really the difference between a folkway and a more is, is like the severity and kind of like how society views the thing. It's not necessarily based on the actual act itself, like what you're doing. Like, you know, if you're doing something with your hands, it's a folkway. Like, no, like folkway is something that is a, is a norm. It's something that we should, like society says we should be doing, but it's not like a big deal, right? Um, it's, it's just kind of like a minor thing. Like if someone came up and like shook hands with their left hand instead of their right hand, you'd be like, that's, that's not what you're supposed to do, right? Like that seems a little bit off. Or if, you know, instead of like carving a, like a pumpkin for, for Halloween, I decided I'm going to carve an eggplant and I'm going to do it for the 4th of July, right? Like that's, that's not what you're supposed to do. Like that seems a little bit off. Um, and so it's not, it's not like the, what you're supposed to do overall, but if, if somebody like carved an eggplant for the 4th of July, I'm not going to be like, what an awful human being, right? Like that's, I'm not going to have that strong reaction to this. And so the like folkways are just those, those minor things that like mo most of us do without even thinking about it. We just kind of accept and go along. Um, but those of you who have, like, you know, traveled and maybe visited other countries and other cultures, like that can be really exhausting trying to like, it, it seems like it shouldn't be, but like, you know, you spend a day in Italy, for example. And like, I remember, like, I actually studied abroad at one point in my life and living in Italy. And like, at the end of the day, I was so exhausted. And like, all I did was kind of like walk around town and like, I got some lunch and, and the reason I was exhausted is because I'm constantly trying to figure out what am I supposed to do here? Like, what is, what's <laughs> the, like, I don't understand the rules of this place. And I think that that's where like culture shock comes in. And those are things we're going to talk about a little bit later, but these folkways are just these very minor things kind of overall that we tend to, to just go along with. Yeah. The way I like to think about this is would somebody take out their phone, right? Because now, now people like record when they're very upset. Um, would somebody take out their phone and record you for what you're doing, right? In the sense that if you are just having a fit and yelling at people, yelling at your Starbucks barista for messing up your order, and now you're throwing things in the air, right? That's very different than if you just didn't hold the door open for somebody on, you know, their way into the Starbucks. Right. Um, and so the, that's kind of like the, one of the ways that I try and distinguish between the two, um, something else that like just kind of was, was coming to mind. So with that, uh, with the folk ways, right. So I'm just thinking about the little things, right. And so I, I like the example you said with the eggplant, I was like, huh, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, like it's something you wouldn't That's even right. think about, but right. Yeah, right. exactly. And for me, I just always try and, and imagine kind of what's happening on a day to day. And just as I'm studying this, or as when I was studying this, um, just like, okay, is this something that you just kind of do automatically without thinking, right? So holding the door open for somebody when they're coming in behind you, or like if somebody says hello, saying hello back, it's all these little things that, you know, no one's really going to get upset if you don't do them. It's just going to be like, you should have maybe, right? Yeah. <laughs> but have you ever seen those, those videos where uh, I'm trying, I don't know if there's a name for them. I wish, I wish I knew. They're like these videos where someone will, like these actors will act out something awful happening in public to see who reacts and who does something about them. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen any of those? Uh, I feel like I've seen maybe something similar, but okay. nothing's kind so, of jumping to mind, right? Okay. So there was recently this video that I saw and it was, um, someone acting as though they're yelling or not yelling, but they're like telling their daughter, no, you can't, um, you can't eat that. Like you're supposed to be losing weight, just basically like fat shaming yeah. their daughter. Yeah. And so, um, the, the video series was just trying to see like how people would react. And in one of the videos, this, um, gentleman was like, he got upset, like he was listening and he started getting upset and he confronted the woman. And so at that point, it wasn't just like a, you know, sidelong glance or anything like that. There was an actual engagement because it reached the point where it wasn't just like weird. It was something that was seen as wrong. Right. right. And so that element of like, is this seen as right or wrong kind of situation plays more into those mores and the folk ways. Um, and that's another, another way to kind of picture it. So if you're ever watching those videos of people <laughs> acting and trying to see what people do, try and figure out if it's a more or not. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, exactly. The folk ways are the more minor things. The mores generally have like a moral component where if somebody does something, you kind of want to be like, yeah, this is the right thing to do. Or if they break the more, you're like, no, that's wrong. Like, and that's not just wrong, but bad, right? Like carving a, a, an eggplant for the 4th of July, that might be wrong, but like, I'm not going to think that person's a bad person, but like stealing right? Like thievery, that's something that there's a moral component to this, right? I'm going to be like, oh, if somebody carves an eggplant, like that's just weird. Um, if somebody steals a car from somebody, like that's that's also like not normal, but it's wrong. And like that's like, a, there's an immoral component to this. And so trying to like separate this, like the mores versus the folkways can be a little bit tricky because once again, like the, there's some cultural differences and like regional differences. You, you talked about like holding the door open and like smiling at somebody. I think like just that's something is different, like Midwest versus New York city, like what you're supposed to do. And like, you know, how, like how much you interact with people as you walk by them. Like that's something that's a little bit different. That's more on the folkway side of things, but um, there's definitely some stuff going on with the mores. I think that if the, because people can interpret stuff a little bit differently. I think that if the MCAT, like for example, not saying hello, some people are going to say like, ah, it's just like a folk way thing. Some people are going to be like, that person's a bad person. <laughs> and that might just be based on like where you were raised. And so I think that the, like the way that the MCAT is going to have to test this is they're going to have to be very clear that somebody has a moral argument against something, or they're going to have to pick something that's really extreme like stealing a car. I'm like, that's something that pretty much everyone agrees is not a moral thing to do. Um, or like, you know, abusing somebody or something like that. That's definitely something a little bit more severe than, than just the folkway stuff. Yeah. And that kind of segues into our, our next topic of taboos, right? Like, so this is going even a step further and saying most cultures, if not all, will consider this bad. Right. And so, like you were saying, there's there's more nuance in the folkways and the mores of, you know, maybe where you are influences quite a bit uh, what you determine is wrong versus not wrong. Um, whereas a taboo, I think this is the one that students tend to be more comfortable with. It's just seen as wrong. Right. It very something like like cannibalism. Right. Yeah. Um, or or incest. I think those are the two examples that I've I've heard the most like that's regardless of where you go, chances are that's going to be seen as wrong um, to a very large degree. Yeah, I, I feel I, I agree. I like the, the taboo and mores are can be kind of tricky to tell apart because they're both like society views it is wrong. But once again, it's a it's a 
level of degrees, like how extreme, like one person litters versus somebody murders somebody. Like those are not the same level of badness. Um, and so, yeah, like the cannibalism and incest, I think are kind of like classic things. I don't know about if you've ever done this, like ever talking to a student, and you're like, give me some examples of taboos. And somebody will say something like, um, like uh, plagiarism. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's totally not that bad. I'm like, maybe I'm just a bad person because my examples of like really bad stuff is goes way past plagiarism. Um, but that's always like something kind of interesting, just kind of seeing what people view as, as that. Yeah. I think also when, when you have these conversations with students and like, they're giving you, like when you ask for examples, it'll also tell you a lot about where, like in that case, like that's very much a student in undergrad, right? Mm -hmm. Like where that's really stressed. And so if, you know, you move, if you haven't been an undergrad and granted, we're not having students who haven't yet been to, to undergrad, um, studying for the MCAT, but like, if, you know, you, if you were to talk to a high schooler, that probably wouldn't be something that they consider very bad because it's not stressed as much. Although I guess that depends on where you go to school right um, or like you somebody know, who like isn't in academia at all and like someone exactly. who just like is like a waitress or a waiter or like somebody who like a mechanic like they're not going to view plagiarism as like that big a deal um necessarily like they are not necessarily that but like generally speaking exactly um also this is this is still like a few thoughts back but now i really want to try carving an eggplant <laughs> like, <laughs> like a, a fresh eggplant because I've been thinking about it. Just like it's firm enough that you probably could. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know where that idea came from because like, it, it does seem strange. I don't think I've ever talked about carving an eggplant, but yeah, I, th I think <laughs> for me, like how I tell the difference between a taboo and a more, this is generally my way of measuring this is, is it something that I'm comfortable talking about because mm. taboos are, are so extremely immoral that if like even just discussing it can be uncomfortable. So like if I was at a, like, let's say I was meeting, this is my, this is my mental test for anything, if it's a taboo or not, is let's say I was meeting my significant other's parents for the first time, right? I think I would be okay talking about like, yeah, my neighbor carved an eggplant. Like that's, that's a folk way. That's like not a big deal. It's kind of weird, kind of interesting. Um, somebody stole a car on the block, right? Like that's, that's, you know, there's a moral component, but like, I don't feel weird talking about somebody stealing what the, the topics I'm not going to bring up during that, like, you know, cannibalism, necrophilia, pedophilia. Like these are things I'm like bestiality. Like, no, these, these are topics that you don't even bring up, right? Like if you're meeting like your significant other's parents for the first time, don't even, don't, don't go into the, that conversation. Um, and so those are the things like, that's my kind of like internal test of like, is something a taboo? Like, can I talk about it comfortably in like different audiences? Um, and I think that might help students kind of tell the difference between a moray and a taboo. Yeah. As, as you started that example, I was a little concerned for a moment because I thought you were going to say that, like talking about you doing those things. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> this took, thankfully, this took a very different turn. Right. Um, but yeah, like, and you know, what you're talking about with these, you know, would it be, would you be comfortable bringing it up? Like, that's also a cross-cultural component to it, right? Like, that's just something you just don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Um and now to say that there are some things that we don't talk about, such as, and we've, we've mentioned this before, like mental health and whatnot, that it's not because it's like there, it, it's not because it's like morally wrong. So when we say that, try and keep the two separate, um, just like in this context of socialization, in this context of sanctions and uh, right. norms, um, that, that moral component is a very big differentiator between some of the other conversations of what you do and don't talk about. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we kind of talked about how, how these rules come into be these norms, right. Folkways, mores, taboo stuff. We've talked about the different types of them. I think it's also really interesting to talk about why they break down and what happens when people break them. And because that's obviously, there's a lot of like thoughts on this and like why people do different things, right? Like how this happens kind of overall. And so this brings us into like a couple new terms. And so we have anime and deviance. And, and these are two terms that I know students get twisted up around like a whole lot. So, so just to like big picture overall, anime is the breakdown of norms, the breakdown of those rules. 
deviance is breaking the rules, right? So there's a difference between I broke the rules and the rules stopped existing, right? So the breakdown of the rules versus breaking the rules. And so of the two, anime is, is really interesting. I think, so anime just means the breakdown of societal rules. And so like, as things occur, like, you know, like what was no, a norm, you know, 200 years ago is not a norm necessarily today. And there's things that have changed like within my lifetime, like, like things can move between these, like what's a taboo, what's a more and like thinking about something like um, divorce, right? Turning back the clock, like divorce was definitely something you didn't even talk about, right? Like this is like, this is like a super severe thing. You don't joke about it, right? Somebody's going through a divorce, you're going to shun them and like have those sanctions, those informal sanctions. Like, I'm not going to talk to this, this woman because she was, she's divorced. And like, that seems so strange nowadays because like, you know, like, I feel like divorce went from like an, uh, a taboo to a more and to now it's like, like it's, totally not a big deal if you get divorced. Like it, it's like being divorced is not against the rules for any of the norms. And so understanding that these rules can kind of break down. I think a lot of times when people think anime, they think anarchy, right? There are no more rules, right? Like they're imagining like just chaos. And that's not necessarily what anime means. Anime is just the rules breaking down over time. And there's a lot of different things that can cause this. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Um, I, for example, during times of like severe hardship, rules tend to get broken, right? And like the rules tend to kind of go away. Like during World War II, before that, women generally didn't work in factories. They didn't do things like that. Like the like women would would be be stuck in these very like feminine uh, quote. Uh, feminine uh, careers, or they were homemakers. And like the feminine careers were just to like buy time until they were homemakers. Um, and that's the, the way society viewed this. But then during World War II, like all the guys go to war and like we need bullets and tanks and and like airplanes. And so now all of a sudden women like can work. And so there's this rule that like women aren't supposed to be working in factories. That rule kind of broke down. And those tend to happen during like times of difficulty, um, times of hardship, um, during wars or famine and, or economic things. I know a lot of societal rules probably broke down a little bit in 2008 um, with the housing like issues and like the economic you know collapse going on there. Um, or during COVID, a lot of the rules kind of broke down a little bit. Um, and I think that this is um, like the, the, it's like a very interesting thing seeing like the rules as they've changed over time and rules kind of going away. Um, don't just a word to students, don't equate it with anarchy. It doesn't mean that there's no rules. It's just as the rules kind of change and go away over time, that whole thing is the the idea of anime. Yeah. The way I kind of picture it in my head and as you were giving your examples, as I was like, okay, there's a lot of overlap with, with what mm -hmm. I was thinking. Um, but a different one is if you think about something like the Hunger Games, Right. Like there are it's not that there are no rules. It's not like the purge <laughs> to right. that extreme. There's a different set of rules. Right. And a lot of the rules that we can think of as applying in a society had been shifted. And so within this controlled environment, you know, there were there were still rules. There were still limitations to what you, you could or couldn't do and how you were expected to do it. Um, and just like even outside of the actual games, um, mm -hmm. like in the man, it's been it's been a couple of years, um, <laughs> like but in the living outside of it, there were different rules that applied. Right. And the same rules that we have now would have had to change and break down in order to make way for a different set of rules. And so with anime, right, you're like you said, it's not we're not reaching purge level. It's not that there's there are no rules, but as the rules break down, people's, you know, their, their willingness to, to live by certain rules has broken down. Um, and so, like you said, that hardship, I think, is really a key to like strained resources and not having things available. Like that's that's what's in common with a lot of the examples, with all of the examples that you gave, right, with with war, with um, like the, the 2008 financial crisis, with COVID, there were limited resources, there were new needs. Um, and so society had to shift in response to and, you know, le um, leave behind certain norms in response to this, um, these pressures of the new society, yeah. as opposed to. <laughs> no, like, but before we go into deviance, because I feel like that's where you're going, like, 
I, I, I want to be kind of careful because anime can also occur if like just a society becomes more like heterogeneous and more like a mixture of different things. So just as like from a point of story, I grew up in a in a very white Caucasian farm town where everyone's poor. And it was like about a thousand people. Um, and I say a thousand people in the town, like technically I didn't live in the town. I live miles away from the town, but it's the town we associated with. And like, a, like high school class of like 50. Um, I think there was a high school class of 30 a couple of years ago in this town. And so very small, very insulated. Um, everyone was white. Everyone's Christian. Everything's the same. And so there are some rules that our little culture had there of like stores, all stores are closed on Sunday because it's like a day of rest. And like everyone wore the same things, right? Just like jeans and like, you know, camo shirts, mostly um, camo jackets and things like this. And this, this sort of like, there's this, you know, these rule sets here. If all of a sudden, like, through some weird, strange twist of fate, all of a sudden there's a big influx of people into that town. And now the town goes from what it was to now it's like, like 14% Hindu and 16% Jewish and 20% Muslim. And, and like, you know, all of the, this like mixture and with like different economics statuses. And some people are very wealthy and some people are very poor. And like all of a sudden the rules of that society start to break down. Like, what am I supposed to wear to school? Like what, what clothes is like cool and what I'm supposed to be wearing. Um, how am I supposed to get there? Like if I'm driving a car that's 30 years old and like held together by duct tape, is that bad? Because it wasn't bad before. Um, and like stores being closed on different days and like the food that you eat at different times, like all of a sudden people are drinking wine at lunch for some <laughs> reason. And like, that seems strange. And that um, that's definitely some anime, some breakdown of the rules. Um, I do want to point out that, um, you know, I talked about, you know, like studying abroad. When you do that, you start to like, you're just trying to figure out the rules of the society. It can be very exhausting. Um, this is, I think, one of the reasons for like nationalism in um, in like the country where people like I, I know how to navigate. I know how to navigate my my life, my town, my everything. My, my I have rules for this life and I understand them. And I know I've been able to carve a life out that I enjoy following those rules. All of a sudden, when those rules change, I don't know how to navigate this anymore. And so this causes this like internal like uh, conflict where you're like, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know how to, how I'm supposed to deal with this. And, and this makes people very uncomfortable. Um, so like, you know, like gay marriage and like different things like that becoming more acceptable. People are like, wait, those aren't the rules, right? The rules are changing. And so people lose comfort with that. And I think that there is like some part of those rules breaking down does come from a society becoming more heterogeneous, um, becoming kind of a mixture. And, and so I know that a lot of times people tend to blame the outsiders because these people came to town and now the rules are changing. And I don't like these rules changing because I knew how I was supposed to navigate this life. And that's something that can be a little bit tricky. Um, I know I've, I've said that I, I think about norms like way more than I probably need to, but like just kind of viewing like different reasons for why people react the way they do. Um, I also think, you know, going to COVID, like the people who hate masks and are like so against masks. I think most people who are going into medicine probably agree. <laughs> it's probably for the best. But um, this idea of like, oh, like I have to change the rules for how I navigate my life. Now I have to wear face coverings and I have to do these things. I think that it's not necessarily like the, like wearing a mask, that's a problem. I think it's having to change the way that I act that is difficult. And that that's, that's problematic for some people because, um, you know, you feel like you've lost control of how you navigate your life and like the rules are all changing. And I think that that causes a lot of this, this internal conflict, something super interesting. Like I think pretty much all kids are okay wearing masks. Like this is something like I have like parents or like, like friends who are parents and like, they're always saying like, yeah, for, like, you know, there'll be like other parents that are like really upset about this, but their, their kids are, don't care. But I think a part of that is for kids, they don't know the rules. Right. And so like saying all of a sudden you're going to wear a mask, that's basically the same to them as like, all of a sudden you got to wear pants. And like, for them, it's the <laughs> same level of like, oh, like, God, oh, this is, it's new stuff. And like, 
And so as a result, I think that's that's why a lot of the people who have um, difficulty like adjusting to things tend to be very set in their ways and not able to kind of adapt. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox. This is something that like I think about like way too often, um, <laughs> but it's just kind of interesting. And I, I think that's a very fair point, right? Like not all of us actively think about these things, but they play so much into our daily life. And, you know, even the trends, like you said, something's changing within your lifetime, something's changing within the last year, right? The last two, three years at this point. Um, So even if it's not something that all of us think about a whole lot, like it's something that still plays a really big role in the way that we experience, um, that we experience life. So I think it's still worth talking about. And I really enjoy the, the uh, idea of, or like talking about how, people might not be interested in, in change or um, that heterogeneity that you're bringing up because it means that they, that there's that discomfort of what am I supposed to do? Um, But I think it also brings up the the point that like with time, right, that anime may not necessarily be seen as a bad thing um, because as people get accustomed to the breakdown of specific rules, they might settle into a new space where that discomfort is no longer there. Uh, so I think also we tend to think of enemy as something like, even in the name, it sounds a little negative, right? It sounds pretty yeah. awful, like almost like enemy. Um, and so, you know, there's, it's, it doesn't have to be this immediate breakdown that's awful, right? Um, like the, I really like the examples you gave just like little by little, um, some things can also, also change. Yeah. Um, like for example, segregation, and like slavery, like those, there, there were rules about like how you did this, those rules broke down. And like, I think most people would say that was for the better. And so just kind of understanding that rules breaking down overall, that's anime, good rules, bad rules, doesn't make a difference, but them kind of like changing and going away. It's the whole idea there. Yeah. And so with that, with deviance, so as Phil mentioned, deviance, right, is an individual breaking these uh, rules, violating these norms. And again, this also tends to be something that we think of really negatively, right? Like, oh, that person's like so deviant, right? They're doing something they're not supposed to do. But what if they're breaking a rule that is not a good rule to have, right? So like, what if someone is breaking a rule in order to, to help someone? If you think about the, the example you gave of um, like se- uh, segregation and slavery, if someone like broke that rule, that would be deviant behavior. But that's something that most of us would agree is not bad right now, right? Like that's, but in that time, it would have been seen as bad because the norm, the rules that were in place assumed that that behavior, um, like that the behavior that the rules went against was bad or that, you know, what the rules allowed was good. So in that moment, right, that deviant behavior is seen in a negative light, whether it's still seen in a negative light 20 years from now is a whole different story. So as we're going through these examples, hopefully that will um, help put things into, into perspective because you might be saying, well, like as I feel that's not bad, right? Just yeah. consider the the context of um of when it was like put into place. So like deviant behavior might be as simple as like picking your nose in public, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's there's a norm that like you don't pick your nose in public. Mm-hmm. But it can also be as extreme as like littering or um pushing someone into traffic. Like those are things that have very formal sanctions associated with them. Um, so deviant behavior runs this whole spectrum of what it can be and what it can uh, look like. So the MCAT has a lot of ways to test you on deviant behavior because the possibilities are darn near endless. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like everyone always thinks most of the time when people talk about deviant behavior, they tend to talk about criminality, which is like breaking the laws. And like that is deviant behavior. That's breaking the like literal formal laws of the society. And so, yeah, totally deviant. But you're absolutely right. Like there are other things like like if I was protesting um you know, like segregation and I went to a sit-in and like, I'm not supposed to do this, right? Like this isn't the how society is supposed to function. And so I, I go to sit in, I am deviant in that, in that behavior. And so I, I think a lot of times people think like deviant as bad as you mentioned, but like deviant, it could be depending on like, you know, you're not supposed to murder. If you deviate on that rule, then I would say that's probably bad. Um, Mm -hmm. but like, you know, you're supposed to like yell at younger children. Like, I don't think that's a rule anywhere, but if that was a rule, breaking that rule is like maybe a good thing. And so just kind of understanding that, um, overall is I think a a pretty, pretty important thing. 
Yeah. And I think this also goes, and I know we were initially planning on like talking about it, but it also goes with the idea of um, like on the flip side of that conformity, right? So people can also change their behaviors in order to fit um, like what, what is seen as a norm somewhere within a group of people or what like society believes to be right. Where like, you know, that's kind of the, the flip side of deviance where I'm doing something that society thinks is wrong, right? So that change in behavior of in the direction of what society sees as wrong versus what society sees as um, as right. And then with with deviant behavior, like just think about it in terms of it deviates from the <laughs> norm. Um, so, you know, we, we get to, we have the luxury of getting to chat about this for a little bit, uh, but just like in terms of very quick memory, when you're studying this, just think about like what those norms are, the degree of morality involved as we've been talking about, and then consider each of the separations of those in degree of morality. And that's usually a really good thermometer for uh, what what exactly the the MCAT is testing you on in terms of is it, you know, did, will it require a formal sanction or is it, uh, will it require an informal sanction? Is it the breaking of, you know, a folkway, a more or a taboo? Um, that can be like a quick way to to gauge that. Yeah, there's also like I, I think we weren't originally planning on talking about like the, the MCAT does list. There are certain some there are some certain theories on why people become deviant. And I do think that that's worth like the AMC outline, which is where all this stuff is coming from. I'm, like, it's not where it comes from. It's why we're talking about it. But um, they, they go into a couple of things like labeling theory and um, differential association theory. But they also have this one theory called strain theory which is another thing that I always like to think about. So um, this is something to, uh, but I think especially kind of like the age group that this is going to, um, this might kind of like, you know, remind you of some of the things that you see in the world. And so uh, like strain theory is the idea that society expects you to act a certain way. And sometimes that way that they're expecting is not feasible. Like you can't, do this, right? Like if society says like, Phil, you should graduate from college. You should be able to get married and your wife shouldn't have to work. You should get a house with a white picket fence. You should get three, you should have three kids and you should both have new cars for you and your wife, right? That's really hard to do, right? Like to get to that point where you can support five people and like a brand new house and brand new cars and, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, you know, straight out of college. Like, I think most people are like laughing at this. I, I don't know. Like the people, I'm just imagining people listening, like, yep, that's not happening. Um, and that's, you know, student loans are so expensive and, and things that have changed there over the last, you know, 30, 40, 50 years um, that like, maybe that was something that was possible then, but it's not possible now. And so we have these expectations, society saying, this is what you should have. This is what you should have. And if you keep going for that and you keep trying, right? Like, listen, I'm working double shifts. I'm trying really hard, but like now, like my relationships are falling apart and like, I still like can't make enough money to be able to like do all of these things. Eventually what happens is you say, screw it, right? Like I don't want that, right? Like if they're saying like, this is what you're supposed to have and you, you, you try, but you can't get it. Like eventually you're just like, you know what? fine, I'm not playing by the rules anymore. And so that can lead to deviance because you start to say, because you can't meet the, the needs of the society or the expectations of society, even though you're trying eventually just say, forget it. And that can lead to deviance in terms of like, it could be criminality. Like maybe you're going to go rob a store, right? Because you're tired of not having the things that you're supposed to have. Um, and so what's really interesting about this is like, you know, within or through the lens of criminality, the reason that this criminality is occurring is not because of necessarily what's going on with the person, but what the expectations of society are, because society's expectations are so high and lofty that it becomes impossible for like the average person to meet. And so that leads to people being like, I, the only way I'm going to get this is if I'm deviant and I start to break rules and things like that. And so that's something that is is kind of interesting. Uh, I, I want to be kind of careful here. Um, I mentioned I grew up in like a very like 
poor white farming community. Um, and the, the social expectations were low. Um, like when I said, you know, driving a 30 year old car, that wasn't just a joke. That was like, no, that's actually what I drove every day. And like, it was held together by duct tape and it was had dents and things like that. But I never felt like judged for that because everyone in my little culture was pretty much the same thing, right? Like everyone's clothes came from Walmart and things like that. Um, and so it's really easy to meet society's expectations in that environment. And so there's not a lot of, of, of that deviancy in response to that occurring versus you look at, you know, other like little subcultures and like what you're supposed to have is, you know, these like, like lots of fancy jewelry and things that are very expensive and the new iPhones and like all of these things. If society is telling you, these are the things that you're supposed to have and, and like you're, that's getting reinforced by like media and people interacting and like everything there. Eventually, you kind of feel like garbage unless you have those things. And so then that makes you want to get those things. And maybe you're more willing to be deviant in a criminal sort of way in order to, to, actually, to actually do that. And so it's just kind of an interesting thing that like what's causing that criminality is not what's going on within the person, but how society is presenting stuff. This is something that I kind of worry about over the last chunk of time because of just social media. And it's like, nobody wants to watch social media of somebody who lives in an average house, right? Like YouTube videos and things like that. Everything is kind of like, look at this awesome stuff and you should have this and Bentleys and like mansions and like these things. And that's, that's like not well, like, re I don't, I don't want to say not realistic, but like, I guess it is like not, obtainable for like the average person, you know, like a single mom who's like working a job, like that's, that's kind of a, a problem if they're constantly being told that they should have this and that maybe isn't as, as available. Yeah. And that's something that I think a lot of us is, um, like, like you said, the age group that is the, the target age group for this is, you know, people between like a little bit less than my age, you know, my age, your age, um, like this whole spectrum. Right. Um, and I think a lot of us have at some point joked with friends like, oh, kids nowadays. Right. And then mm -hmm. insert something here. So like the, the big one I remember growing up was like phones, you know, having a phone was a luxury. If that, you know, when, when like I was growing up, um, I knew people that like now kids have, you know, their kids have phones and their kids are like, toddlers. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was not something that, um, that like we had growing up that said, I'm sure that there were people from more affluent backgrounds that their kids might've had phones at an earlier age. And a lot of that has to do with the, the necessity or the, that feeling of needing a phone in order to fit in. Right. Like that wasn't as, as prevalent when I was growing mm -hmm. up, right? Like you didn't have to have a phone to be like, feel like you fit in with other people. Whereas now, like if you don't have one, well, why not? Right. Um, and so that's not like you were saying, like that's not always feasible for a lot of families. And that kind of keeps going on as, as time goes on. And as um, ah, there's, there's so much I want to say um, as like the technology advances and whatnot, but also sticker prices keep going up. And then you start wondering like, okay, are our kids going to start, you know, shoplifting more because they can't get these brands that they feel like they need based off of, you know, how other people are, are telling them that they should be dressing, how social media is telling them that they should be um, living. And so uh, that's something I actually wonder now. I'm, I, as I'm saying that, I'm wondering if like, there's been a trend, an uptrend in, in shoplifting and, you know, with certain like brands or things like that as society's pressures for what you or how you should live and what you should have um, changes and almost continues in a, in a quite aggressive fashion. Yeah. <laughs> like you were saying, because that's what we, that's what we're bombarded with. Yeah. And I'm a little bit older, which uh, I'll go with that. But like, like talking about like phones being a luxury, absolutely. Think. It wasn't that long ago. Like during my, like, I remember in high school, like somebody saying like, Hey, there's this new website called Facebook. And I'm like, like, Oh, that's interesting. Like what's going on here? Like, Oh, it's just a way to talk to people. Like, can't, can't you just call them? Like why, well, why, what's the point of this? Um, and so I, I know that that seems like such a foreign world right now. Like the idea of like people don't have phones in their pockets and they don't like Facebook doesn't exist and like things like that, like just social media in general, like doesn't exist, which wasn't that long ago. Um, like less than 20 years ago was a realistic scenario. And that, um, 
like just things have changed a little bit. And so this idea of like socialization kind of pushing people is something that's a very, like it's, it's almost kind of scary. Um, just the, the possibilities and capabilities, um, you know, socialization can be a very positive thing, right? Like encourage people not to litter. Like everyone's going to agree. That's a great thing. Um, and so there are some good that can come out of it, but it's also a little bit dangerous, um, especially as, you know, that strain theory, which I was talking about earlier, um, you know, it's just something, once again, I think about it a little bit <laughs> just because it's kind of a, like, why do people act the way they do and how might that be changing over time due to the way that they are taught about how they should act and the, like just the media and stuff that they see. Um, just a super interesting topic overall. And I feel like just generally people are going to be talking and studying that for like decades um, because yeah. there's obviously a lot of change going on there. Absolutely. And I'm really curious uh, for folks who are listening and watching um, this. I'm really curious. Like I know we have people who are right, you know, still in, in undergrad and studying for the MCAT, people who are in, you know, grad school or post backs, people who have had careers and are switching careers, like the whole um, this whole spectrum. I'm really curious what has changed in your lifetime um, that like you feel as a result of society's expectations. Like I'm just really curious to, to hear what people have to say. Um, yeah, so especially just like different cultures and um, just kind of understanding like what was normal for your family and that sort of thing. It's something that is was very strange. And I always like I like this is something that was like a real problem for me is I felt like I was trying to navigate the academic world when like I was the first person in my college to get a, or my my family to get a bachelor's degree. And that's, um, you know, that's, you know, this is kind of like farming community versus the like academic world and like the rules are different. And like, I kind of didn't know how I was supposed to act is a bit like going to Italy, right? I'm like, uh, I, I don't know what's going on here. Um, and so just kind of like understanding that it, it's not, it's not all as big as that, like different nations and continents, but even like within a city, like different, like neighborhoods, right? The rules change a little bit, like, you know, kind of like what's happening here versus what's happening there and the way that you're supposed to act um, and within families. And that's something that is, is super interesting. And I think bear people should be thinking about this more, especially if you're going into medicine and you're going to be interacting with all, all these people from this community and like understanding that the way they view the world might not be the same way that everyone in this community views the world, because you have these like little sub pockets um, where people just, you know, have their own socialization, their own norms, values, and just kind of understanding that overall. Absolutely. Um, we have, there's so much more that we could talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll hold off just because, you know, we've, we've already had so much today. We do have a very special guest next podcast. So please stay tuned. We are going to have um, Nicole. So I won't, I won't say much more from, from our admissions um, team. So stay tuned. Really excited to talk about uh, med school apps tune back in next week. Yeah, we're going to be talking basically, once again, not to spoil, we're going to be stepping away from the MCAT a little bit and just big picture in applying to med school and why people should be thinking about that before they actually are. And there's going to be some, I feel like some horror stories from Azai and me of like, both of like, I did something totally wrong and this hurt me like in my application. Um, I don't want to speak for you Azai, but like, I definitely have some strong feelings of like, there are some things I did not do well and I should have done better, but I just didn't understand how to navigate the system. Yeah. Definitely a lot, a lot of uh, tips and tricks. So go ahead and and stay tuned, um, and you can hear all about our own shenanigans <laughs> during our application process.